Hey, it's Tess, content creator, model, presenter, and host of the Tess Talks podcast on a mission to ignite curiosity. Hello, my fellow skin lovers. Get ready for this one hour of absolute skincare wisdom. I sat down with Terry Vincent Jones, the founder of Synergy Skin and Sinternal Supplements. This episode is jam packed with essential skin science that will elevate your skincare game. We are deep diving into the must have ingredients and the ones to avoid, plus debunking common skin myths along the way. We also geek out on my favorite topics like longevity and biohacking, discussing all the tips to boost your life span, or I really should say health span. (laughs) You'll know what I'm talking about shortly. And if you stay around to the end of the episode, Synergy Skin have offered all our listeners a limited time discount code, which I highly recommend jumping on because these truly are some of my absolute favorite products of all time. Also, while I have you, I wanted to let you know that I'm about to take a short break from recording episodes for maternity leave, which is very exciting. But I did want to ask just a little favor from you guys. If you love this episode or if you've enjoyed any of the Test Talks episodes in season one, it would really mean the world to me if you could just take a short moment to leave a rating or review on whatever platform you're listening on right now. It not only means the world to me, but it truly does help me to keep these conversations going. All right, I think it's time to get into the episode. So let's get curious. Terry Vincent Jones, welcome to Test Talk. Thank you, Tess. Lovely to be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited to have you on. Um, for a bit of a background for the listeners, you're an Australian scientist, cosmetic chemist, published author, and founder of one of my favorite skincare brands, Synergy Skin. And you've also recently launched Sinternals, everything which is developed here in Australia, which I love. Now, I don't normally start my episodes by reading someone's bio, but I have to say I was really impressed by yours (laughs) and there was so much on it that I was like, I don't want to miss anything on here. So I'm actually going to read your bio out. Okay. This is (laughs) awkward. (laughs) No, I love it. So you hold a Bachelor of Science in Immunology and Microbiology, a postgraduate diploma of Formulating Chemistry a postgraduate diploma of education in biology and senior science. You're a proud member of the Australian Society of Cosmetic Chemists and you're a world-recognised formulator with over 20 years of experience, a lecturer in the field of skin biology and cosmetic science and the author of Skin Formation, A Clean Science Guide to Beautiful Skin. Okay, that is a very impressive CV, I have to say. Oh, I'm old, so <laughs> I've gathered a few over the years. Have I missed anything? <laughs> no, Tess, thank you. That's lovely. So there's a lot in that. Can you break it down a little bit for us and tell us how this kind of all started? Wow, okay. I think one of the biggest drivers for me was as a young girl, mm. I had the most amazing dad and he was a feminist of the 70s, mm. sort of in a simple way. He believed um, that women could do anything they set their minds to. And he believed in me and he was, he, he was, um, we had a, you know, I would say quite a lower middle class family background. I, you know, mm. didn't have, we didn't have a lot of money, but what he did do is he spent what he had educating me. And I wanted to live up to his expectations, um, tried hard at school, mm. fell in love with biology. Oh my God. <laughs> and and chemistry. science nerd. Love I was it. such. A, I was an absolute <laughs> nerd. In fact, a friend of mine said to me the other day, "I can see you at school. You wouldn't have been great at sport, but you would have been hitting the books." Yeah. And he was right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so my biology teacher was very, very influential on me too. So mm. it kind of started at a really young age. And a lot of the mm. teachers would say, "Oh, you know, um, do you really want to do science?" And my dad would say, "Push it, Terry." He said, "This is what you love. You do that. You do your degree, and, and you enjoy it." And I did every minute of it. And to this day, I, I'm overly um, committed to, to science and understanding it and explaining it to others. I think that's so important. We mm. mystify so much science, so unnecessarily. Um, my son, who's, who's an artist, is now very open to the world of science and learning it and I just love that. We should make it accessible to everybody. Mm. Yeah. It really rang true um, when I first heard you speak because I've been a 
big advocate of Synergy Skin for quite a few years now. I think I've been using the products for probably over five years and it's been one brand that has been so consistent in my bathroom. And I used to get sent a lot of products and I love trying new products, but I have always gone back to Synergy. I've always had them as my staples. I just absolutely love them. And I was invited to your event recently when you launched your new supplement brand, Sinternals, which we'll get into. <laughs> but when I heard you speak, I just got a whole new respect for your brand and for you and what you've created. There is so much science behind what you do. And then seeing you launch this supplement brand and talking about everything that I am so passionate about from biohacking to NAD, which we'll get into. You even touched on like our food and our soil and how that comes into play with our inner systems and externally. And I was just so impressed, I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I do walk the talk. Um, I've been um, very focused on, on health for many, many years, mm. more recently on health span as mm. we do age and mature. And you know what, that's a gift. I've always said that. Um, maturity is a gift we are given and the thing is to hold on to it. Mm, so true. Yeah, yeah. So obviously the curiosity stemmed in you quite young. So how was that when you left school and you started university? How did all that come about, that journey of combining science with skincare? I've always been, okay, going Backtracking a little bit, mm. I was very nerdy, probably not um, a very social girl and um, my skin was okay but I just wasn't, I, I, I don't know, I just got, I got into it a little bit later and um, I was always into the science and then I discovered this magazine called Dolly Magazine which you're far too young to know <laughs> we about. We all I'm love sure, Dolly. But, but, oh, you do know about Dolly. Okay, oh, yeah. So I was so into it and I started learning how skincare worked and how makeup mm. worked and everything like that. So there was always an interest in both sides of it. Mm. But interestingly, I was also a chubby kid and didn't know much about nutrition and I wanted to be healthier. I put myself, and I would never recommend this to any any child or mothers who do this, but I put myself on an eating regimen at the age of 12. Wow. Came back to school, transformed in terms of how I appeared. And it was it wasn't about me as a person but it was about my confidence mm. and somehow I triggered something about my own inner confidence and my whole life changed. I, I had more friends, I was more social, I was enjoying myself more, um, I was even doing even, I was even doing better at my studies mm -hmm. and it was confidence and I think for me that was always in the back of my mind, particularly with launching Synergy. It wasn't just about the science of understanding skin health and explaining that to others. It was about that one thing that, that flicks over in your brain that makes you feel good. And when I'd get Facebook messages when I started this 20 years ago, I'm um, sorry, about, well, started getting the Facebook messages about 15 years ago with um, people feeling good about themselves mm. and, and Instagram messages more recently and saying, you know, I feel great, I can get out of the house now, I can, I can go on a date. And that's not, that's not the, the skin cells responding, that's your brain responding, that's the confidence. Mm. So I think there's a great link between increasing your health internally and externally mm. and one small change externally can have a profound impact on how we perceive ourselves mm. and that's what happened to me at the age of 12 and sometimes that little girl wants to make that happen to others too. Oh I love that so much and yeah. I think that's why I love what you do so much is that you are so much about the internal to the external and I think that's missed a lot in the conversation around skincare. Yep. It's often always about the topical and the external but it doesn't start there. No. No, it starts on a cellular level mm. and it starts on an emotional level as well. Mm. And I think we need to look at at the human body, males and females, as holistic. Mm -hmm. And this is probably where Sinternals was always simmering away in me. I just didn't have the the um, the background in terms of my lab yeah. and and the infrastructure to take it off. But I but I've always studied it. Immunology, microbiology was so much more akin to to um, internal wellness and skincare was, my skincare journey came much later. So I did my degree mm -hmm. and then I did my education post-grad and I didn't do my um, formulating chemistry till I was in my 30s. Right. Uh, so that was something that came along much later. Mm. I knew the science of formulating but doing the, the actual studies was, was fantastic to be able to do that and, and learn about formulating. So how did uh, Synergy Skin come about then? 
Okay, so I was working for an Australian skincare brand for a few years, helping them formulate and educate. Yeah. And then I started my own marketing business, helping um, plastic surgeons, doctors and cosmetic physicians explain procedures and ingredient technology to their clients mm. because I felt that was really important to explain the why as much as the what mm. and I still think that's important. So I was helping these doctors have their patients go on a journey with them so they'd be empowered and it got me realising we should take this further. I was, I was approaching my 40s at the time and I was noticing changes in my skin. My children were growing up and I couldn't find what I needed. It was either back in the day glycolic acid, sometimes lactic acid and prescription retinoids. And there wasn't a lot more and a lot of the, the more sort of excipient ingredients or the emollients and the nurturing ingredients, but there was nothing that, that packed a punch. So as is the case with many entrepreneurs, if you can't get it, you make it. And I could because I was a scientist. Mm. So I remember I sat down one day waiting for my daughter to come out of a movie at Chadston Shopping Centre and I wrote down my business plan of what I could bring to the <laughs> table. That. Yeah, I love knowing where business plans yeah. start. Yeah, it's always it's the most random. On a piece of paper, yeah. putting all these points, and I'm thinking, I'm a scientist. I know how to make skincare. I, at the time, was primarily catering to women, but now much of our market is with 25% of our market is men, which is lovely. Mm. But I know what women need. I know what I need. Mm. And I started to create this story that would be my USPs. Mm. And it just developed from there. And I, I'd saved money, which I called my running away money back in the day, which was um, all of, I think it was $40,000, which was a lot. But yeah. I'd saved it up. And I opened a little clinic in Camberwell, which was a skincare clinic called mm. Skin Formation, harking to the, to the, <laughs> to the um, title of my book. And all I did in that clinic was formulate and um, consult. So I had mm. an injecting nurse with me and a skin therapist because I'm not qualified in either of those but I did the formulating mm. and I didn't do it in the back of the clinic. I actually wrote my formulas on a spreadsheet, took them to a compounding chemist in South Melbourne who I'm still friends with to this day and had her make those formulas because even back then I wouldn't do the backyard jobs that I mm. see in – it's an unregulated industry. Mm. So I did it myself through Marie and created a bit of a cult following um, the GFC hit in 2008 and people stopped having treatments because they couldn't afford mm. the the, um, the the laser treatments or the injectables but they couldn't not afford to go without my skincare products which mm. was back in the day the biggest ones were Uber Zinc and Vitamin B Serum. Mm. And I thought, wow, this was an epiphany. I have a clinic. I'm paying um, people to work in my clinic who aren't working. I have an expensive laser machine that costs me over $150,000 and what's really doing well is the skincare. Mm. And it was like, aha. So I gave my database away to the local beauty salon. I found a place in Melbourne in Burwood, a tiny, tiny little rental with a, enough space for a lab. And I started doing it myself. And that's mm. when everything headed north. And that was the start of Synergy Skin. That's incredible. Yeah. I love hearing the journey of yeah. how things come about and how I guess life just kind of pushed you into this direction. Yeah. So why would you say that your products are superior to other skincare brands on the market? Um, the word superior kind of, I don't know, I don't know where, whether I'd say I'm superior and I think that's, I think there are many unique points to Synergy that mm. resonate with some mm. and I think for me being in the heart and soul of the formulas, so the founder is the formulator, mm. so I have so much skin in the game, pardon the pun, I really do, I really know it to the 0. 0.0001% of essential oil. I know what, what's in there and why it's in there. Um, my clean science philosophy, which isn't clean beauty, and I need to state that from the mm. beginning. I iip the phrase clean science about 15 years ago um, mm. when I was in LA in a medical conference and it means the merging of the best of laboratory science and synthetics combined with the best, best of naturally derived ingredients with clean transparency of information, with a clean planet in mind and as much as possible with ethical mm. clean ingredients. 
without the fear mongering. That's so good because the term clean beauty doesn't have the best rap anymore. I no. think it's been very overused. It's kind of like the term organic that gets thrown oh, on that like is such <laughs> a, it's natural. Organic is almost often an oxymoron anyway. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I just think I believe you need to promote your products by what they do, mm. not what they haven't got. And you mm. can get caught up in that because, yes, in my lab there are ingredients I will not use. Mm. Um, but I'm not going to go on about them. Mm. I'm just going to use the ingredients that I know have a great big tick with safety. Now, whether they're estrogen mimickers or not, it's all about the dosage too. So mm. paraben preservatives have got a bad rap because supposedly they mimic estrogen. There has been studies done. However, you probably need to be putting parabens on your skin for many, many years to get a negative effect. Right. So I won't use them, mm. absolutely, but... I'm not going to say a company that uses them is a terrible company we should never put their products on. Yeah, okay. I think for me, I work on delivery, dosage, data. Mm. So optimal delivery to the target cells. The best dosage, if something delivers results clinically at 5%, I will use it at 5%, not at half a percent to mm. say it's in there, which I hate. And the data, everything is driven by the science. I will not put any ingredient in unless I've got in vivo and in vitro clinical data to support it. And that's how I work. Mm, I love that. And I do want to delve a little bit more into ingredients, but I think we should start with like general skin health. And it's one thing I did notice when I started using your products is I found a lot of brands I had been using at a point where I did have quite bad acne, very stripping, very mm. drying. I also mm. had a lot of bad experiences with some beauty clinicians here mm. in Melbourne. But using your products, I really feel like they were nourishing my skin. They weren't stripping it. I was a big fan of your cleanser um, and your Dermacalm and your zinc moisturizer in the mornings. And you could just kind of feel the difference that my skin was starting to become my skin again, mm. as opposed to becoming reliant on products to feel like skin. And I think that can be a big misconception too when having skin issues and going through different skin problems that you need to throw all this stuff at it. But I yeah. think it was, well, one, the science, but also just the simpl simplicity and quality behind your ingredients list, I think is what my skin was really seeing the benefits from. Thanks, Tess. Thanks for recognising that. And it is important. I think the skin is our only organ that's constant, the largest organ of our body that's constantly in touch with the external environment. So it's mm. constantly challenged and inflammation is the key to any negative skin condition, whether it's acne, psoriasis, eczema, dermatitis, anything. Mm. So we need to minimise that inflammation. And a lot of the old school ingredients and some still on the market are way too aggressive for our skin. Mm. And it's all about the synergy of our skin. That's one of the reasons I call it synergy. It's the balance between, you know, just enough um, to, to kick it into doing something mm. but not give it too much inflammation to cause a negative side effect. Mm. So I do very, very carefully curate the combination of ingredients so there's minimal inflammation but maximal impact on the skin. Mm. So talk to us about skin microbiome because I know you talk about that a lot yeah. and I feel like we don't really talk about that. We talk about the gut microbiome yeah. but what's the skin microbiome? It is huge and there is such a skin-gut connection but also a skin-brain connection. Mm. So um, for, for me as a formulator, it's all about the combination of prebiotics and postbiotics, mm. not probiotics. Probiotics are fine for the gut because our body knows how to process them. But prebiotics to me are fundamental because they feed the good bacteria on our skin. So our skin has a whole community. In fact, there are more microbes on our skin, sorry to nerd out. I know, I than, love it. Give than, us the facts. Than, than there aren't skin cells. Mm. So we have got this huge diverse community of good guys and good girls and bad guys and bad girls. Mm. And the bad need to be there because the bad bacteria actually trigger our immune system to work better. So we don't want to obliterate everything, okay? Mm. We want more good, less bad. And prebiotics, which is like the food for the good bacteria, feed the good bacteria and don't so much feed the bad bacteria. So you get that lovely balance of more good, less bad. Mm. And that reduces inflammation, helps address acne, gets our skin balanced and in a beautiful space. So it's got a better barrier and it protects us from pathogens and protects us from external aggression. Mm. So that's your prebiotic. So that's the food. So what kind of ingredients are you looking at then inulin. that you're putting in? Inulin is the okay. most important. Um, there's a lot of prebiotic fibres that we take internally and I also take them. 
but inulin is one of the best ones. So it's just a fine water soluble fiber that you put on your face with um, with the postbiotics, mm-hmm. and that feeds the skin. So then you've got your postbiotics, and this is a whole new realm of microbiome technology. So basically, if you squeeze a, a good bacteria and all the goop comes out, mm. that's the postbiotic. So mm. it's not the bacteria that we need, it's what's inside the bacteria. And it's all those goodies and those molecules that reduce inflammation, that, that balance our body, that, that signal our body to make, to make beneficial molecules. Mm. They are postbiotics. Mm. So if you put just the bacteria in a skincare product, say we use bifidobacteria or lactobacillus, these bacteria will die within seconds if you have a preservative. And there should be no skincare product on the market with water in it without a preservative. Mm. So people who are touting, I've got probiotics um, in my skincare product, unless they've got a protection around them, they will be killed within seconds. <laughs> so what you need in your skincare product, product is not the probiotic, but the postbiotic, mm. those active molecules. So what, what I use is a bifidobacteria ferment so Mm -hmm. you ferment the bacteria you get out the goodies and you put those goodies in the product and Mm. that's the postbiotic and that's what's going to be calming for your skin so you're feeding the good guys and you're calming the skin with the postbiotic does that make sense fascinating i love the nerdiness of it all (laughs) (laughs) so does that then correlate to also improving your skin barrier because i know that's something that is spoken about a lot these days and i think it's something that uh, generally, we have probably over attacked is our skin I think, Yeah, and and that's and I do blame exfoliation on that. Mm. Our, our body naturally exfoliates, and we're pushing it way too hard these days. And I, I do believe in in I use lactic over glycolic personally, but there are lots of other AHAs, but not too much. Don't don't throw everything at your skin. Mm. The barrier is the most important first line of defence in our skin, and if we're not protecting that. Everything falls apart. Can Everything. you explain how the skin barrier works and why it's so important? It's it's basically made up of a stratum corneum, with, which is primarily dead cells. Mm. And those dead cells have lipids in them also, which actually protect and prevent what's called transepidermal water loss or the water's removing from our skin. Those dead cells also form a wonderful barrier to prevent bacteria, viruses, fungi, yeast, entering the skin Mm. and also pollutants. And there's a lot of pollutants out there now, um, particularly smog, which is a very small molecule called PM 2.5 and that's very, very toxic to our skin. And What's that come from? It comes from smog and air pollution. Oh, okay. And it's it's particles less than 2.5 nanometres in diameter. So they are tiny, tiny, tiny tiny, and they can get into your skin and cause free radical damage. Wow. So there are so many things that can get into our skin, also using harsh cleansers Mm. or cleansers that aren't pH balanced, Mm. using a strong acid. All these things will disrupt your barrier. Having an unbalanced microbial community, that's why we love using prebiotics and postbiotics. So there are so many things that can disrupt that delicate barrier and let all the bad things in mm. and le- and and prevent the and, and allow the water to to leave the skin and if we lose moisture then we've got a very very compromised barrier mm. so we have to keep the moisture in and keep the baddies from coming in too so what are signs that people can look out for in their own skin to tell if maybe they've got some skin barrier dysfunction it will be definitely the first signs will be dryness mm. your skin may not look any different but it feels parched Mm. and everything will just soak in really, really quickly. That's probably the first sign. Other signs will be obviously flaking, Mm. irritation, um, stinging of the skin with certain ingredients. Um, You can be inherently sensitive and those people will be more inclined to have a compromised barrier. Mm. Um, I noticed in during COVID when people were using sanitizers, and this is a little controversial, I actually think we overuse sanitizers now. I think we need to ease way back on that because we have wrapped ourselves up in cotton wool over COVID for two years, overuse sanitizer, and the minute we're out there um, exposing ourselves to a normal microbial environment, we'll get slammed. Mm. And then what do we do? We've got sanitizer in the airport, sanitizer at the cafe, sanitizer outside elevators. Um, yes, we need to wash our hands absolutely and, and use normal hygiene. But I would encourage everyone to go back to how it was mm. pre-COVID days and not to be so obsessive because we're wiping out our microbiome on our hands and our mm. face 
unnecessarily. I completely agree. And we're doing it on so many different levels as well, like different household toxins and chemicals that are coming in and all these things that are attacking, exactly, attacking our microbiome yep. internally and externally yes. almost everywhere we look. Yes. And, I mean, you can get obsessive <clears throat> about it and you do need to live, but we mm. also need to be hyper aware of overcompensating mm. at some times and I do think sanitizers do play a role with disrupting our barrier mm. big time. Yeah. Well I'm glad um, the conversation I feel like is changing a little bit about how we treat our skin because when I first had acne maybe like <clears throat> six years ago my skin barrier was overly destroyed mm. as I mentioned before by a few clinicians here in Melbourne and that was just from the overuse of peels, the overuse of lasers, an incredibly intense skincare regime and I think now only slowly the conversation is changing that it's about nourishing, hydrating, getting that water into the skin. And balancing. And less is balancing. more. Yeah. yeah. I mean, really, um, pre and postbiotics are the ultimate balances of the skin. Mm. And if there was one product I would ditch, it would be a toner. They okay. are the biggest waste of money and the biggest skin stripper ever. Mm. If we want to keep our skin at a pH of 5.6, which is what the skin loves, it, plus or minus a couple of pH points, mm. point, point, zero one pH points but um, we shouldn't be stripping we shouldn't be using alcohol alcohol mm. is so disruptive for the skin barrier um, so think of balancing as using microbiome balances rather than alcohol balances because mm. it, it just strips the skin and takes out the oil takes out the moisture and you're back to square one mm. so what are top three products or ingredients that you think everyone should be using okay I would definitely say niacinamide mm -hmm. and that was probably the first um, one of the first products I ever developed was my vitamin B3 serum. That is the the number one ingredient for the barrier in my opinion. Mm. It works on ceramides, it works on collagen also which is in the dermis, it works on the epidermal proteins, it works on cellular immunity. It actually, niacinamide has been clinically shown to reduce the incidence of non-melanoma skin cancer. That's huge. Wow. That is huge. Wow. So niacinamide is hands down my f and pigmentation as well it works on um, uneven skin tone mm. so that's my personal favorite the other one obviously no-brainer sunscreen mm -hmm. and that's that's a bit of a controversial space in terms of do we go mineral or do we go organic mm. organic meaning containing carbon not organically grown um but yes yeah, sunscreen is mega important what, what is your preference i I love mineral sunscreen mm. because zinc oxide is my favourite because not only does it protect against UVA and UVB in one ingredient, which is there's no single ingredient that does that, mm. um, it also is an anti-inflammatory and um, it just calms the skin. And we find a lot of acne sufferers who use um, zinc oxide as their sunscreen, mm -hmm. as their sun protection, as a side impact have less acne and less inflammation. Mm, so, um, And what do you think is the optimal SPF rating to be wearing every day? It's a tricky one. I don't think higher is better because I, I've got the opinion that higher actually lulls people into a false sense of security. And mm. a few years ago, especially in the States, everyone was SPF 100. Mm. And even SPF 50, where I do think there's a place for SPF 50, um, it lulls people into a false sense of security that they think they need to put it on in the morning and then that's, they're done for the day mm. and they don't realise they have to reapply. And the other thing is there's only a few um, percentage points difference between an SPF 15 and a 30. Mm. It's like a 2% difference in some protection. Yeah, I think that's what people don't realise. It's very yeah, minimal. Yeah, <laughs> it's very minimal. So I also believe, and this is also controversial, that we need sunlight mm. and you know, there's the thing I, I often say is we can't hold on to our convictions too tightly as scientists. Mm. That's not being a good scientist. Back in the day I was like, don't go out in the sun, wear a hat, wear sun protection, don't let the sun touch your face, you know, you'll, you'll get skin cancer. Well, you know what, I think I should have just calmed my farm a little bit <laughs> because we need, we need the sun. Plants need the sun, animals, humans especially. Mm. So I try every day to get out in first light. I'm not great at it, but I try my best. I do red light therapy every mm. single day. I believe in the power of sunlight, mm. but I believe in dosage. And don't go out in the middle of the day. Don't bake yourself. Uh, don't go out for more than 20 minutes between the hours of 11 and 3 unless mm. you are protected. 
So yes, I protect. But I'm it's so balance. glad you said that because I feel like we do skim over that a bit. And obviously, we we're talking before about how we both like Andrew Huberman, and he talks yeah. a lot about how getting that first sunlight is yes. really important. And I know so many of us are vitamin D deficient because we spend so much time in an office, in the house climates yeah. whatever it is in an office environment so, everything yeah i think to it. take into consideration that balance and getting that first sunlight and that hit of vitamin d is really important Absolutely. and using common sense to be like okay this is not a good time to go in the sun no. and this is and, and your body knows that when you mm. feel you're burning i mean I've, I've just come back from a one of the best holidays i've had in my life in europe and the sun was fierce mm. so yes i would always cover up and sun protect during the day when i was out on a tour mm. but i try to get out in the morning or I try, I'd love ha, have a lovely evening walk when the red light's best in the early morning and late evening. Mm. And that's magical for the skin. Mm. And we need UVB to make vitamin D. Yeah. Albeit we can take supplements as well, which is great. But yeah, mm. light is energy and, and it's life. I love it. Yeah. Okay, what's your last third recommended ingredient or product? <laughs> uh, well, it's a hard one because there's so many that I love. Yeah. I would probably say retinoids. Yep. Um, but not harsh retinoids. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have three types of vitamin A I formulate with, both two encapsulated retinol and one is called hydroxypanacolone retinoate, which is a relatively new derivative and it's called HPR for short and it works in a very similar fashion to prescription retinoids but without the irritation mm. and it doesn't need breaking as much metabolic breakdown as retinol. Mm. Um, interestingly, I've noticed so many people on, on um, videos and podcasts talk about vitamin A as retinol. They think retinol is vitamin A. Mm. But you have to understand um, vitamin A is an umbrella and the umbrella, the tip of the umbrella is called retinoids and under that umbrella is retinol, just one type. Retinaldehyde is another type. Retinol palmitate hydroxypanacolone retinoid, there are a number of prongs on that umbrella, but mm. the top of the umbrella are called retinoids, not retinol. Mm. Retinol is just one type. Are there any other like skincare myths you just love to debunk? <laughs> yes, that <laughs> hyaluronic acid gets to the dermis that we put, the ones that we put in our skin. The only hyaluronic acid that gets to the dermis from the outside is the injectable ones mm. um, because even the smallest, and I've, I've, I use um, four types of hyaluronic acid in my lab, high molecular weight, medium, low and micro. Mm -hmm. And even micro hyaluronic acid, which is five kilodaltons or less, which is tiny, it does not get to the dermis. Mm. But it works very differently to the heavy molecular weight hyaluronic, which sits on the top and plumps the skin. The lower uh, actually works on the, on the immunity of the skin and is an antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory. So it's amazing that it doesn't get to the lower levels and actually plump the skin from the dermal level. Mm. That's another myth. There are so many things like this coming out. Now, I actually heard something recently about vitamin C yep. and I'll probably get some of it wrong, but I think the main thing that I took out of it was that vitamin C, as soon as it hits the air um, and a non-like pressurized, I guess, it's container oxidized. environment. Yeah, it doesn't work. Mm, absolutely true. So this is when we're talking about L-ascorbic acid, which is the, the most basic form of vitamin C. So we need to keep that protected from air, from light and from moisture mm. or else it oxidizes. So this is why I, I actually formulate with L-ascorbic acid in my lab but I will not put it in a watery environment because the minute I do that, it starts to oxidise within hours. Mm. So what I encourage is, is for the user to add the moisture to it at the time of use. Mm. But vitamin C has derivatives just like retinol does and just like um, retinoids do with retinol and palmitate and everything. So you have um, uh, ascorbyl ATIP, ascorbyl tetraisopalmitate. You could have ascorbyl palmitate. Um, Jekyll, uh, oh, there's so, there's, sorry, I've gone Jekyll glucoside, I think. No, that's not it. Uh, sorry, I feel like half the people that say will have no idea what know, these sorry. words are. <laughs> there's many, many different derivatives of vitamin C. Yeah. What I'm getting at is L-ascorbic acid is the most unstable. Yeah, right. It breaks down so easily, so mm. we have to protect it. Mm. So there are all these derivatives and my favourite one at the moment that I'm using in my lab is ATIP, which is ascorbyl tetraisopalmitate. And that is an incredibly stable form of vitamin C. And when you put it on your skin, it absorbs into in the skin between the cells and 83% of that molecule gets converted to L-ascorbic acid inside the cell, which is where it's used. Mm. So it's a much more efficient way of delivering vitamin C to the skin um, and a more direct way. 
and it doesn't break down. So that's my preference at the moment. So interesting because when I look at that and consider some of the products on the market, I feel like there would be a lot that simply don't work because of yeah. the way that they're just simply packaged. And the thing is I think a lot of um, formulating chemists uh, are great. There's a lot out there who are uh, incredible mm. but there are a lot that just think that they can throw a whole heap of things into a, into a bottle and hope they work mm. and they don't understand the side reactions and they don't understand the stability. So mm. I've always had a, a sort of a thing in my lab where I work on the seed principle and I kind of coined this acronym years ago. Everything in my lab has to have stability S-E-E-D, stability, and they can't break down in air, light, oxygen or in the bottle. Mm -hmm. Efficacy, they have to work at the dosage required, not sub-therapeutic, sub but at the dosage. Elegance, it has to be an experience for the user or else no one will use mm -hmm. it. And finally, D is for delivery. Mm -hmm. It has to get to the target cell and not hang around in the wrong part of the skin. Mm -hmm. You know what, I can tell that you're a good good founder just from the way you speak. <laughs> I love it. What about ingredients to avoid entirely in skincare and makeup? Are there any that you just want to steer clear for steer clear from or suggest that people should steer clear from? I again I'm I'm so anti fear fear mongering because of a lot of what's happened in, in um, the clean beauty movement. But I've got a long list of ingredients that I don't have in my lab, but I think in more general terms I would definitely not go outside of a pH range of around about the 5.2 to 5.8 unless that molecule needs a, particularly, um, a particular pH to work. Mm. And sometimes we need acidic environments and exfoliation occasionally like um, AHA, BHA serum, but generally don't strip the skin. Mm. So avoid a pH... Um, that's that's very stripping and also i'm not a great fan of um high level surfactants like sodium lauryl sulfate because i do believe that they do strip the skin more than the gentler surfactants mm. um i'm not a fan of chemical or organic sunscreens in the main at the moment mm. and it's not because of the whole endocrine disruption thing it's more because of the fact that they do cause sensitivity in the sun mm. and um, typically um, your mineral sunscreens don't do that however never say never if there are organic or chemical sunscreens that come to the fore that are totally safe in terms of reactions on the skin I will look at formulating with them right yeah mm. Because you also launched into makeup and so I'm curious to know is there certain ingredients that you avoid with makeup? I know since I have had sensitive skin there are certain ingredients I now avoid, things like talc and things that can yep. be um, pore clogging ingredients. Yes. What do you recommend? Um, I don't like artificial fragrance or artificial colour. Mm. Okay, I'll tell you why. Artificial fragrance is one of the most sensitising ingredients that you can use on your skin. I have erred towards no fragrance more recently and and in saying that I also use essential oils. But even essential oils can cause sensitivity. Mm. So artificial fragrance, it often takes about 40 or 50 chemicals to make something smell like an orange or you can use orange essential oil which is gentler on the skin. Mm. So that's one of the things I do avoid. The other thing is artificial colour is often petroleum derived FD and C colours They've served no function. They're very tiny molecules. Um, if your skin is broken, you could have some issues with it entering the skin. Mm. Whereas why not use iron oxides as pigments? And that's what I use for all the Synergy skin, for all the Synergy Minerals products, mm. because the iron oxide is a blue light blocker. Mm. And we know the blue light blocking is important for pigmentation mm. and for free radical damage. So I use iron oxides as my colorants instead of artificial colors. They're such good hacks. I love yeah. it. <laughs> it's amazing how once you start entering the world of ingredients, you can become a little bit obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. And and you know what? I was I I was doing that too for many years, mm. but now um, I just work on what certain ingredients can do rather mm. than bagging others. And people figure it out, and it's their mm. choice. I mean. I have got a list of no-nos um, and when I talk to my suppliers about taking on a new ingredient for a formula, even if it's an emulsifier or a preservative, mm. I will say, okay, has it got these particular ingredients in it because mm. they know I won't touch it and they'll only present me with mm. ingredients that they know are permitted in my lab. So let's talk about Synternals, your yes. new supplement brand, yep. which I can see makes you very excited. It, it also does. makes me very excited. 
Why was it important for you to launch into the supplement industry? <laughs> this was something that's been very close to my heart for so many years. Mm. Um, it's a very difficult space to get into in the manufacturing area and, and I manufacture everything in my lab. We're completely vertically integrated with skincare. Mm. Getting into supplements is, is the next level and we're just starting to get into that now, which is fantastic. So it's always been something I've wanted to do, but I haven't had the infrastructure to do it. Um, I've always wanted, with, with Synergy Skin, I can generate confidence from the outside in, if that makes sense, because one small change in our skin can make us feel great, which is what I found at the age of 12. Mm. Um, but what about from the inside out? And the skin is a bit of a barometer to our health and I often and our eyes, the skin and our eyes. And if somebody has that glow or that sparkle or that, that, that energy, you can tell they're healthy. You don't mm. even have to do, any, do a blood test. You can see that in them. Mm. And I want to bring that out in everybody and everybody has that right. Mm. And I think as we age or as we mature, I don't like the word ageing, <laughs> as we mature, we are um, – we, we, we're, we're lacking in certain things like NAD, mm -hmm. um, certain supplements are needed in our body and also because the, the soil is so depleted. So I think there's a huge space for us to explore supplementing but only if we need it. Now, mm -hmm. if you've got the perfect diet and you have every single nutrient in your diet and you lead the perfect lifestyle and, and so on and so on, then don't worry about supplements. But Who I, know I, I, know, <laughs> I know I need them. I, mm. I have had blood tests and I have, I, I have had a vitamin D deficiency in the past. I don't mm. now. But supplements are a huge, a huge part of wellness. Mm. And, and to me it's about health span. Mm -hmm. It's not just about lifespan. And I know that health span is becoming a big word now. Mm. But I, I'm now 61 years of age. I do not want to limp along for the next 40 years in a state of frailty. I want to be vital. I want to be having a wonderful time with my husband. I want to be a good mother to my adult kids. I want to be a grandmother. Mm. And I want to do that with vitality and with a sparkle in my eyes. Mm. And I know supplements can help me do that. And, and there's a lot of other things. It's not just a one-size-fits-all approach. Mm. It's not one, one answer. But, yeah, we've all got the right to do that. So tell us about the very first product that you've launched, which is an NAD supplement. And yep. I'm going to harp on in a second about why I love NAD yeah. <laughs> so much. And as soon as I'm not pregnant, I can't wait to try it. Um, but, yeah, tell us about how that came about. Well, for me... The mitochondria is the basis of pretty much everything our body can do. It's the basis of our energy. And can you give a little explanation? For so people these that don't are these are little sausage shape um, entities in our cells called organelles, and they float around in the fluidy, mushy sp space in our cells called the cytoplasm, and they are responsible for making energy, not just for picking up weights or for running around the block for making energy for every single process of our, cell, of our bodies, for making muscle, for making all the amazing chemicals, so our hormones, um, our bones, our brain cells, everything we do is the mitochondria creating the energy for doing that. And NAD, because NAD boosting is becoming a huge thing at the moment, mm. NAD is basically like a shuttle service for electrons, which are little tiny particles, and they shuttle those electrons in the mitochondria to enable the mitochondria to take our food, glucose, and create energy in the form of ATP for all those processes. So NAD is, is it's actually a cofactor, but it's like a shuttle service to make that happen. Mm. And as we get older, our NAD levels decline. So we need to boost them back to their old state. So NAD boosters has become huge. Mm. But apart from providing the electrons to the mitochondria to make our energy to, for everything, NAD also is important for making these proteins called sirtuins. And sirtuins are also in all our cells and they actually repair our DNA. Mm. And, and our DNA repair mechanisms become depleted as we get older as well. So NAD to me does two things. It activates the sirtuins or it increases the, the production of sirtuins and it also enables our mitochondria to make energy for absolutely everything. So mm. I think we need it. It's an absolute powerhouse. You can see why it's become so popular. Yeah. It was interesting a few years ago, 
I did a test and I know people are going to ask me what was the test and I honestly can't remember but I'll find out and put it in the show notes. But supposedly my mitochondria function wasn't optimal. Okay. So I started doing a few different things to try and improve my mitochondria and I'd always struggled with poor energy on and yeah. off anyway. So I started really prioritising things like LED uh, light therapy, mm. hyperbaric oxygen chambers. Mm -hmm. But then I also started taking NAD um, as an injection, I think intramuscularly. Ooh, did brilliant. you feel like you had somebody standing on your chest? It, <laughs> you, you know what? Yes, you do get that heart rush yeah, for about yeah, 30 seconds yeah. and it's a bit of like this whole kind of heat wave through yeah. your body. Um, but that was very, very short lived. And when I first started taking it, I was having it every day. I had so much energy that I could not go to sleep at mm -hmm. night. And I was like, okay, well, I really need to pull back on this. You, did you, yeah, you have to take your NAD boosters before three o'clock in the afternoon as a general rule. Yeah, I would always have it like first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. And overall, the benefits that I found from having NAD were life changing. Mm -hmm. I would never get brain fog. Mm -hmm. I had consistent energy throughout the whole day. I just felt normal again. And it was interesting because down the track, I spoke to a nurse about it. And she said that she actually found that people who had such a strong positive reaction to NAD, often people who were showing signs of chronic fatigue, which I found very interesting. Yeah. Um, but that's when I became a really big advocate for NAD. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, it's something I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, that below the age of 30, you probably have to be careful with how much you're taking because you don't want your body be to become too reliant on it getting it externally. It starts to decline from about 25, but depending, okay. again, depending on the individual. Right. Um, but where our bodies are amazing at making an AD when we're young. Mm. Yeah. So I wouldn't say a really young person would need an NAD booster, mm. but when you, if you have got any metabolic disorder in terms of mitochondrial dysfunction, um, often you will be recommended an NAD booster. Mm. Um, and I know for me and anybody really, uh, I would say over the age of 30, it would be a, um, an mm. important part of the supplement. So talk to us about what's in your supplement because I know that there's more than just NAD. It's not actually NAD, it's a derivative, it's an NAD booster mm -hmm. and it's called nicotinamide riboside. And nicotinamide riboside or NR as it's commonly mm. known is actually highly bio bioavailable. It also is able to um, increase the NAD levels in the blood mm -hmm. and there's been numerous tests show, showing that, that it, it actively increases NAD levels and very, very quickly mm -hmm. at the dosages in Energize, which is the NAD booster from Synternals. But coupled with that, I also use niacinamide. Niacinamide works on a slightly different pathway to nicotinamide riboside. It's another form of B3 that also boosts NAD levels but on a different pathway. The other thing about um, niacinamide, why I've added that, is it crosses the blood-brain barrier, which NR doesn't. So it's much more active with that and it is also linked to the non-melanoma um, skin cancer and all the skin benefits as well. I've also coupled that with two powerful antioxidants, resverit uh, quercetin and resveratrol. Mm -hmm. and, we, and there's a lot of research also about quercetin at the moment. It is excellent as an antioxidant. Mm. Um, we also have seen evidence of it reducing histamine levels, so fantastic for people with allergies. Mm. And there is evidence that it's what's called a senolytic, which means it um, quietens the cells that are those zombie cells, the, the cells in our bodies that don't divide anymore but they don't die either. They're like they, they hang around. Mm. And senolytic cells or senescent cells um, release these inflammatory markers that actually can damage our other cells. So the trick is to to get rid of those senescent cells and quercetin has been seen to do that as well. Mm. So it's like a, it's got four major ingredients, NR, niacinamide, quercetin and resveratrol mm. and all of those work synergistically to increase energy and wellness and longevity. Wow. Yeah. And it's interesting because you don't really hear about niacinamide as much being in a supplement form. You hear a lot about like on the yep. skin yep. topically. Yeah. Um, so no, I guess this product really is tailored to getting all those benefits you said but also improving our skin. Absolutely. Mm. And, and you know, obviously my, my brand was founded on skin so there has to be skin benefits in it. Mm. But for me it's so much more than just skin. It's about whole body wellness. And, mm. and anecdotally for me, although there is evidence now that, it, that NAD boosters do impact circadian rhythm, but I was – I started off um, my holiday – or it wasn't a holiday, the first part was in the Netherlands. I was working with my distributor – and it was two full-on days hitting the ground running and I flew straight from Melbourne to, to the Netherlands, not a minute of jet lag, didn't skip a beat straight into the presenting for two days. Wow. Then started my holiday, which was amazing. 
and um, had so much energy. And my husband's also noticed he has just got boundless energy. And, we, you know, we're averaging 20,000 steps a day on holidays mm. at the moment. Then we got home to Melbourne. It's usually harder coming from the northern hemisphere to yes, the southern hemisphere. Yeah. So I know I didn't have jet lag going and I thought, oh, this will be interesting. How am I going to go coming home? Mm. Nothing. Wow. I just slept like a baby the first night. Got home late at night, slept, didn't skip a beat again. So um, there's um, something, there's I definitely something that. going on. <laughs> and I love what you said before about our food quality and the soil because I think we don't take that into consideration. You're right. I think there's still some scepticism about supplements. Mm. But if we were getting the full array of nutrients and everything that we needed from our food, mm. then maybe we wouldn't need supplements. Maybe we wouldn't feel as lacking as we do in our day-to-day. -day. We definitely wouldn't. And I, and I think... Um, you know, if we could go back to our great grandparents' time and, mm. and living on a farm with a huge diversity of, of nutrients and also the micronutrients, mm. we definitely wouldn't need what we need today. Mm. I think one of the biggest problems that I see is that we um, we wrap the food in cotton wool as well, and we we use too much fertilizer and a lot of pesticides like the glyphosates, which we know mm. aren't Shocking. healthy for humans. Mm. But we basically don't give the the plants a chance to fight. Mm. So if you don't let the plants fight, they're not going to make those defensive chemicals which are called antioxidants. Mm. So the more you stress a plant, for example, I think it's a, it's a type of grape in, in um, is it the Merlot grape? Um, anyway, one of the grapes has, has been stressed more on the vine and that has a much higher level of antioxidant. Mm. Um, some to organically grown tomatoes, they don't use high level um fertilizers they don't use pesticides so the plant has to fight harder to be healthy and they're the plants we want to consume but we don't get that anymore because farmers and rightly so they're trying to produce high high loads and and and, and high payload for for their for their money mm. so they're going to use fertilizers and and I don't blame them but it does mean that our nutrient level is is re is reduced. Mm. So we need to supplement that, and mm. and I think that's where supplements come in. Mm. It's this chronic cycle that we've got to somehow try and break break yeah. out of. But I yeah. guess you're doing the right thing. The first steps to kind of help us get out of it. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, organic is great, but we can't always. It's, you know, we're we are in a in a cost of living crisis and not everybody mm. can afford organic. So let's just do whatever we can mm. and try and eat healthily and, and avoid certain things. Like, for example, avocados, you don't need organic avocados because they've mm. got a nice skin. thick skin, mm. but you do need, if you're going to choose, go organic strawberries or raspberries or tomatoes. Mm. Yeah. I love that you're into this kind of biohacking space and that it has come through your work so much. Yeah. Do you have any other like top recommendations of some biohacking tips for like optimal skin and wellness help? Oh gosh, I should live live in live in my home. <laughs> I feel so sorry for my husband sometimes. Okay, so um, I do have red light therapy. I have um, a panel, and I also have a full body panel. Which one do you have? I um, just got one as well. I have I have um, the Omnilux. Nice. Um, which I love. Got the infrared. Yeah, yeah. And it's in, near infrared and yeah. and red light, which mm -hmm. is the perfect combination for me. So we have it up against the bed head, so I lie across it in the morning. Mm -hmm. And when I travel, I take the Omnilux mask with yes. me, which yeah. I love as well. And I also um, do grounding. I have a grounding mm. mat and a grounding sheet. Wow. Um, so I try and get the you know electrons from the earth uh, flowing through my body because mm -hmm. we wear shoes all the time and that's one of the things I think that we we um, maybe should avoid. Mm. Walk on the sand. I know that you've, you're um, you're moving to a lovely location soon yes. and you'll be able to have lots of beach walks. That's it. so good for you. Yeah. Um, so I do that. What else? I obviously drink filtered water. Mm. I have my supplement stack, including Energize and a few other things in the pipeline. Mm. Um, what else do I do? Oh, I have um, – I do my exercise. I do resistance bands training. Mm. I Because I'm older, I don't tend to lift really heavy weights. I've got um, a, a, tra a little mini trampoline. I jump on that every morning. Oh, my God, it's so good. Um, <laughs> and I've got a, um, a hyper vibe. I, I have a little vibrational plate because it's really good for bone density and maintaining balance and muscle mass. Um, 
that's about it. And eating well and um, moderation, but I do like my champagne and my red wine. Oh, yeah. I have to have a bit of balance. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. It sounds like your routine is honestly optimal. I, f- I feel like you've mastered it and it clearly works because you are glowing oh, from the inside out. Thanks, Tess. <laughs> and your skin is amazing, I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> I try. I mean, I'm not perfect, but, you know, nobody is. But we can all do what we can and I just want to be around for as long as I can. That's it. Yeah. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today. I do like to end my episode episodes um, by asking our guests to leave a little verbal entry in the Test Talks diaries. This is just one lasting bit of advice or a quote or an insight that you feel is important to share. What would you like to leave behind? I think for me, stay curious for as long as you can. Mm. Um, I, I've always been a curious person and just never stop asking questions mm. and always be open to changing your mind mm. because um, strong convictions loosely held is the key for me. I love it. That's yeah. the ethos of the whole podcast. Yeah. So you nailed it right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Tess. And as promised, the team at Synergy Skin have offered all of you a discount code that you can use at checkout. Just type Test Talks for a site wide discount. Now, this is only available for a limited time, so I recommend jumping on this offer super quickly. You can find the web link in the show notes below or head to synergyskin.com. So, again, just use the code Test Talks at checkout. Enjoy. Thanks so much for listening. If you loved the episode, please subscribe, rate and review. It honestly means so much and helps to keep these conversations going. And I'd love to connect with you. You can message me on Instagram or TikTok and I've left all the details from the episode in the show notes below. I'll see you next week.